It says starting event. Yeah, there we go. So we're live. So we'll just wait for some attendees to catch up. Should bring them in. There we go. Okay, so welcome to session two of our online conference. Um, I hope some of you were able to attend the first session. It was a really, really good, good session with some interesting talks. Um, so just a reminder for people that weren't in the first session, we're asking people to try and reserve the chat window just for questions. Um, you can send a message directly to the administrator if you're having problems with audio or video or you can't hear us. Um, if your audio does switch off and you can't hear the speaker, it's very helpful just to refresh your browser and that usually helps you to come back online. Okay, so um, any technical questions to the administrator and then keep the chat window ready for questions. Um, so our first speaker um, is Michael Schroetner from Lincoln. Um, so just a brief history, before working at Lincoln, uh, Michael studied uh, physics in Germany and did a DPhil in engineering science at the University of Oxford. Um, he's also worked for Zeiss and also had his own company related to optical surface metrology. Um, Linkham design and manufacture stages, electronics and software that can be used with microscopes, spectrometers, diffractometers to enable scientists to analyze and characterize many different types of sample. Um, today, Michael will talk to us about a robotic cryo vitrification device and cryofluorescence workflow for cryo EM and single particle analysis. Um, so over to you then, Michael. Thank you very much. I'll turn my video off. Thank you very much. I hope um, everyone can hear me. Thank you, Orox, for organizing a conference in these not-so-easy times. Uh, I will speak today about uh, robotic cryovitrification and a special device we are designing to help uh, sample workflows in this area. Uh, this is a collaboration between uh, Lincoln Scientific in the UK near London and the Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands. Here's the outline of my talk. In the first half, roughly, I will uh, talk about the application, the motivation for uh, our development and work. I will outline the relevance and significance of this uh, technique for uh, understanding of protein structures and more. Uh, and in the second part, I will discuss um, the development of a robotic plunger system which um, we have done in a collaboration which we hope will ease um, the burden of sample preparation and enable uh, or improve the ease of use uh, for some of the key workflows in cryo. Um, so there are three major cryo applications I would like to focus on. Uh, first of all, if you produce a cryobiological sample, the sample is very well preserved down to a, a ultrastructural level because you are producing um, a vitrified uh, sample in ice of a biological sample um, in a near native state. And naturally these samples are compatible with the vacuum that is required for an electron microscope. So the uh, single particle analysis workflow is a recent key technique and it allows you to obtain protein structures of small uh, proteins in a solution. Then there's also the correlative light and electron microscopy and also the cryofluorescence which can be done in conventional fluorescence or super resolutions. We will discuss these uh, applications for a short moment. Let's start with um, the single particle SPA uh, analysis with this workflow. So there was a Nobel Prize in 2017 um, and uh, they received it for developing cryo electron microscopy for the high resolution structure determination of biomolecules in solution. And just uh, briefly to explain uh, how that works. So the goal is to 
obtain a structure of a protein molecule. So in the M you have um, interaction between the electrons uh, from the M and uh, the sample electrons and normally you could do tomography. However, if you have a, such a small molecule uh, you cannot record a tilt series of your object and because the sample would be uh, basically degraded from the imaging. So the, the um, so they have done something very clever to get around that problem. So what you do in the single particle analysis is you have a large collection of identical molecules and they are prepared in a very thin sheet of ice. So you obtain a random orientation uh, of these molecules in that uh, thin film of ice and you're not able to control the physical orientation of the particles but later on with computational algorithms you extract the uh, angle of the view you're seeing you also do subtomogram averaging to reduce the noise and with these tricks together you can still obtain uh, essentially a tilt series of the molecule of many identical molecules and reconstruct the 3D structure of that molecule and that's um, quite a powerful technique. So in recently uh, there are or currently there are more than 10,000 um, protein structures resolved um, with the technique there's exponential growth in the uptake of the method and historically uh, normally um, protein structures would be uh, investigated with x-ray diffraction analysis um, that's still heavily used and it's still the number one however here you need to purify the, uh, the protein and crystallize it while with single particle analysis the big advantage is that you don't need to crystallize the protein and that's a it's a big advantage or in some cases um, the only way to achieve uh, the structure and it's expected that within this decade single particle analysis SPA will overtake x-ray uh, to study biomolecules the structure another uh, relevant technique for cryo is cryocorrelative microscopy also called CLEM uh, here you essentially can combine the very high resolution of the EM or the X-ray microscope and combine it with a very specific labeling technique for example GFP and other um, engineered labels in order to uh, select and pinpoint interesting locations in cells or biological organisms and then decide with a, a fluorescence whether a certain event takes place and then investigate in more detail with a complementing EM at higher resolution. The um, workflow for um, CLEM or correlative light and electron microscopy usually starts with um, live cell imaging then typically you use a plunge freezing or also high pressure freezing you can then quite often use uh, also FIP uh, focused ion beam uh, machining uh, to create lamellas for tomography if you wish so there are many different uh, workflows in this uh, correlative light and electron microscopy last but not least there's also the um, cryofluorescence workflow and compared to ordinary uh, fluorescence uh, you obtain reduced photo bleaching and in total more photons out of the sample and that helps uh, signal to noise and also the um, super resolution methods so now we have uh, discussed a few applications why it is useful and helpful to have uh, cryo samples and we will now come to the main topic uh, to the 
uh, cryoplanger system we are developing. Uh, it's a collaboration between uh, Leiden University Medical Center and Lincoln Scientific uh, and we make instrumentation for uh, cryoplunging, also cryoimaging, but today we will only talk about the cryoplunger system. The goal is to produce um, a sample where you have vitrified ice um, and to do that you need to have a very fast cooling rate in the order of uh, 10 to 4 Kelvin per second and that can be done with plunge freezing. Typically you plunge into liquid ethane to vitrify your sample. Um, here uh, the motivation for the uh, for the development. It is not easy to prepare uh, perfect uh, cryo samples and there are several um, details which um, need to be uh, considered or solved. So in the existing plunger system typically there's blotting paper used in a humidity chamber uh, to adjust the film thickness of the sample. But the blotting paper also gets soaked and wet and therefore is not as efficient later in the process um, as it should be. Also the manual handling of the electron microscopy grid can damage it and uh, therefore you might lose your, your grid or your, your sample. Also typically you need to glow discharge the grid to make the grid uh, hydrophilic which can uh, be an extra step and an extra risk for sample handling and in existing systems you usually need to calibrate the blotting distance and force and overall you cannot see the process because uh, the blotting happens between closed um, tweezers or forceps. Now um, we have designed and implemented um, a device uh, where many of these tasks are automated and it uses a fundamentally different process to adjust the film thickness of the cryo sample before plunging. So first here we go through the steps. First you have the automatic pickup of the sample grid uh, from a slot. You then do a glow discharge process to make it hydrophilic. You apply sample by typically dipping it into a sample solution or you could um, apply it with pipetting as well. Then you, you monitor the samples um, with a real-time built-in optical microscope. You adjust the film thickness. Then you plunge in liquid ethane and later you automatically load it into a cryo uh, transfer cartridge um, for, for the processing. So these are the steps and we will now look in more detail um, at uh, the different components. Here on the left you see the in blue you see the cryo compartment where and also the small uh, container for plunging. On the right hand side you see um, the glow discharge unit, uh, also the pickup locations, the observation and film thickness adjustment position, sample dipping and so on. The micrometer at the front is, is the built-in microscope to allow real-time monitoring. We will now go through the individual steps. On the left-hand side you see the automatic uh, grid pickup um, where you place the sample grid um, ready for processing. In the right-hand image you see the glow discharge unit where in a vacuum you will process your grids, you can adjust uh, the current, the time uh, and the vacuum and so on and you can process your grid. Um, later you move on to dipping the glow discharge grid into a sample solution. You can also add fiducial markers or other things if you wish. Um, there is more than one dipping container and this image on the left is only one shown but uh, there are more in the current design. Um, and after you apply a sample, you um, retract it slowly from the liquid um, and you place it, like it's shown on the right hand side, into a microscope uh, imaging setup which is able to do transmission and uh, reflection. And you can then 
see in real time uh, your grid. And there are several indicators in this uh, real time image, for example, the meniscus uh, near the grid bars. You can also see uh, interference fringes. You can see the holes in the um, transparent film in the quantifold, for example. Uh, all of these give you an indicator on the um, thickness. And then you plunge your sample into the cryogen. And um, one of the key techniques that is different is a suction method, which you use to adjust the film thickness. You use a calibrated stream and um, you uh, can adjust the film thickness while monitoring it in real time at the same time. Here this is another example um, how you monitor um, the film thickness. I will speed up a little bit in the interest of time. Um, We have uh, already arrived uh, at the summary. So uh, as I outlined in the beginning, there are biological samples, cryo samples required for many workflows. Most importantly, the single particle analysis workflow to determine protein structures for CLEM, uh, correlative uh, light and electron microscopy, and also for cryofluorescence. Sample preparation is quite often the bottleneck um, and we tackle this problem with the design of the automated plunger system uh, which I've uh, outlined which uses a completely different technique for blotting and also takes out a lot of the skill um, that's required from the operator because the handling is all done um, in an automated way. Um, I think um, we are ready to take questions. I hope we are okay for time. Hello? Yes, we're fine for time. Thank you very much, Michael. That was a great talk. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you now. Perfect. So we had a few questions come in while you were mm -hmm. talking. Um, so from Roland Remenyi, um, which of these techniques, um, SPA, CLEM, ET have already been applied by scientific community to SARS, COVID, etc. research. A very topical question. Oh, um, with COVID, SARS, I'm not up to date. I would assume that the SPA technique is the most relevant. It's probably used to study some of the proteins involved in the uh, COVID mechanisms. Mm -hmm. I believe it's used, but I must admit I'm not up to date because it's evolving so fast. We'll have to ask Google, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I expect that yeah. SPA, out of the three techniques, SPA is for COVID most relevant, as it is for, for many biological mechanisms, because you can get the 3D structure of proteins, which allows you to then guess or understand, hopefully, the, the real uh, function of the 3D biomolecule and the, the micro machines in the biological organisms. Sure, sure. Um, and from Leandro, um, can you use any kind of tweezers or is it a specific type that you need for your, for your sample loading? Um, we use um, a specific uh, modified tweezer which is in a special uh, module which is pre-aligned uh, and interchangeable. Um, I uh, it's it's easy to interchange because it is a small pre-aligned module, but it's not that you can uh, basically bring your own because it needs quite a high precision alignment. Sure, understood. Yeah. Um, from Thomas Sharp, uh, what's the minimum volume of sample you need? Okay, so for the uh, dipping cup where you place your uh, sample to be applied with uh, dipping, it's roughly uh, 10 microliter but it could be different if you apply it with a pipetting technique. So there could be slightly less, but roughly that's the typical uh, volume you need. Okay, um, and from Todd, uh, can different gases be used in the glow discharge state, i.e. argon, hydrogen? He says it's a lovely looking instrument. Oh, thank you. Um, at the moment, uh, it's designed to use air for the glow discharge, because that's what most people, what the majority, majority does. 
um, we could probably add other gas ports if it's a major demand but um, at the moment it's um, aiming for for air uh, for glow discharge okay um, James Streetly asked how long does the suction take to prepare a grid is it similar to blotting ie two to five seconds Yes, it's similar. So you, what you can adjust is you can adjust the timing and also the calibrated uh, suction flow rate. And uh, you can also watch in in real time um, the effect, but uh, a few seconds is, is a typical time. Okay. It will also depend on the viscosity of the uh, sample. Okay, okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. And lastly, just in the interest of time, um, Bozhtek, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, um, he says, you've been showcasing this product for several years now. How close is it to being a finished product? Is it, is it ready? Um, we are in the process of building uh, another batch of uh, four instruments. Um, we are uh, expecting this, uh, this year. We are probably slightly, because of the COVID um, situation, um, slowed down and we are also expecting a, a larger uh, study a paper to be published showing um, the application of the device to different samples and the ice quality okay okay oh and one one last question popped in um, is it the same yeah. conventional grid as used in a tem um broadly yes so typically we use a uh, quantifoil grid so it it is a it is a grid but it has a thin uh, film can you hear me well yes i can hear you yes okay, we, you've just lost a, your video yeah. that's fine okay um so uh quantifoil is the most typical uh, film but uh, we have also used c flats and others so yes it's uh, we can use a wide range of grids Perfect, perfect. Well, I think we should move on now. Thank you very much, Michael, for that talk. It was really interesting. Um, and perhaps if Zubair is in the room, um, he can turn on his video and audio. Hi there, Zubair. How are you? Hello. Can you hear me fine? Yes, I can hear you. While you're getting your slides sorted out, um, I'll just introduce you. So um, this is Zubair. He's a research associate at the University of Nottingham. Um, he moved to Nottingham to complete his master's degree and PhD after his undergraduate studies at the Birla Institute of Technology and Science in Pilani. Um, he's experienced in advanced biological imaging and has a strong interest in badminton and dance as well. Um, today, he'll talk to us about a, a cryocorrelative imaging approach for subcellular characterization. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Zabert. And if Michael, if you could turn off your video so we can uh, just see Zabert, that would be great. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Can you find your slides there? Um, should I click on next or should I share screen? Hang on a minute. Um, let me get up your uh, slides. There we go. So that should be your presentation ready. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, thanks for the uh, thanks for the invitation as well. So as you know, I'm Zabair, and today I'm going to be talking to you uh, something about how we can use cryocorrelative imaging approaches to study biology at the uh, subcellular scale. So um, I'll go, uh, in the beginning, I'll go with a bit, a bit of a background on cryocorrelative microscopy of CLEM, and I'll give you an introduction about how we do CLEM at uh, Nottingham and NMRC, the Nanoscale Centre. I'll introduce you to my research question and then give a couple of examples for demonstrating what we do um, at, at our facilities. So uh, Michael did a beautiful job of giving a, a brief uh, introduction to Clem and uh, saves me the time as well. So basically um, the cryo um, correlative of light electron microscopy, or in short, CLEM, is a powerful approach to study subcellular structures in its native uh, biofunctional state. This is because it um, introduces the uh, combination of three really important aspects in biological imaging. One, it preserves cell, uh, our samples in uh, cryo mode, which gives us native state preservation. And then it allows for fluorescent imaging, which gives us superior contrast. And we're able to relocate our sample of interest in electron imaging, which gives us superior resolution. 
Um, here are two examples. Um, the first one on the left shows a cellular topography example. What you're looking at here is uh, cells which are frozen in liquid ethane, and these are uh, U2OS cancer cells grown on gold grid with um, labeled with DAPI, which is in blue for the nucleus, and in the plasma reticulum in green. And this is a correlative mark over here. We're able to refine the same cell uh, in electron microscope, and you can see you could get improved resolution of the topography. There's another example where we're looking at subcellular ultrastructure. What you're looking at here is fluorescently labeled um, extracellular vesicles. They're really tiny, so with the optical resolution, you're not able to get much information. But if you refine the same location uh, in electron microscope, in, in, in this is transmission electron microscope example, we're able to correlate that fluorescence to um, the lipid bilayers that constitute extracellular vesicles. So to summarize, we know that uh, cryoclem is not just a, a powerful technique, but probably and possibly the only technique in which we can be able to study such um, sensitive and tiny structures. So to give a, a brief introduction to cryoclimate in MRC. So, um, Philippa, can I share my screen because the latest slides haven't been updated? Yes, yes, I'm happy for you to do that. Okay. So, yep, entire screen share. Apologies for that, Tabeth. All right. You, you might want to turn off your video feed just to give us a bit more bandwidth. No worries. Uh -huh. Okay. I'll turn off my video. So, are you able to see? Yes, that's fine. Yes, that's fine. That's fine? Okay, great. So, uh, a little bit quick in the interest of time. This uh, flowchart here shows um, the typical day at cryoclem in our facilities. We get the cells of tissues, we cryopreserve them using plunge or high pressure freezing, depending on the depth of the tissue. And then we subject them to cryolyzed imaging. We call this function analysis because we're looking at functional protein of interest. And then we relocate that using a cryofib milling instrument, which is particularly used to make um, subsections for further processing. From there, the sample goes to ultrastructural analysis for cryotium here, or cryospatial mass spec for lipid. <laughs> procedure where we can run, uh, put our samples to and fro between instruments but also this also shows that um, um, that our samples suffer from damage um, frost contamination and low throughput because of this procedure but there are ways to get around it and um, I'm going to introduce you to some of the things that we did to get around it at first we built a custom cryotransfer stage as you can see on the right so what this does here is to have different amounts of spaces here you can uh, have a clem holder or a light, a light microscopy grid holder, which can hold multiple samples at the same time. We have single grid holders. We have planches to hold cryopreserved tissues. We have multiple screws to hold uh, sections and subsections that we lift out, and also an holder for tomography. So briefly, what this does is to improve the throughput efficiency and reproducibility and reduce contamination during our sample transfer from one instrument to the other. Next, we looked at cell viability on growth on our grids. Uh, we've chosen H6 under mesh um, carbon piloform coated um, gold grids with correlative marks. This improves the visibility and viability of cells um, for cryogenic imaging. Then we looked at improving the quality of fluorescence imaging. At this end, what we did initially was to uh, take stacks of wide field cryo images and then deconvolve them to improve the signal to noise ratio. And that is really good for subcellular imaging. What you're seeing here is an example of um, uh, breast cancer MCF7 MCF cell lines labeled with um, endoplasmic reticulum dye. Um, another way to do this is to improve the uh, hardware. So, what we've shown here is a uh, the, the microscope that we use, which is a Nikon E400 upright microscope attached to a Lincoln cryo stage. What we did was to attach a clarity confocal setup, and uh, currently we're also attaching an MFC1 Monterey Z controller. There's an example of a 
uh, cryoconfocal image. Uh, this is a bright field image of cells grown on those grids that I've mentioned before. And these are MF MCF7 breast cancer cell lines. And, and they are labeled with the endoplasmic reticulum dye in green and, and nuclei in blue. And you can look at the merged image and this really shows the improvement in signal to noise ratio compared to white field images. Really helps with the subcellular imaging that I'm gonna be talking about. So my research question is uh, through to what can be used a cryotin procedure uh, and extended for compositional correlation. To understand the depth of the question, here is a, um, a description in the slide which shows current possibilities with um, CLEM and how a research question uh, plays a role in it. So currently we can uh, cryopreserve our cells or, or tissues in native state and we can use the cryolot imaging for functional analysis or for looking at functional proteins. And then we can do cryo-electron uh, imaging to look at the ultrastructure and we can correlate between them. But we are limited uh, in terms of composition. We still don't know what the uh, structure we're interested in is made up of. Um, and it, this is limited to the proteins that we tag. Um, so that's the real question. Can we correlate compositional uh, information and high content information into this uh, existing conventional uh, cryo procedures? Um, um, in short, we think we can do that and um, in a couple of approaches. There's an introduction to uh, 3D cryo orbi sims, which we believe it'll be in, uh, in, will, will extend the cryo claim to subcellular lipidomic analysis. To give a brief introduction, the orbi sims allow spatial mass spec uh, at subcellular resolution. Uh, briefly, uh, this is how the instrument looks like. Um, it is a uh, time of flight analyzer coupled with a Orbisims platform, so it gives a good spatial resolution and 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 chemical resolution. To demonstrate how we uh, transfer samples from culture to instrument, um, it's a description. We grow our cells on glass cover slips, and these glass cover slips are flat surfaced, which is which is good for topography and has an sorry an organic contrast and stability. We superglue um, uh, gold grids behind the glass cover slips for correlation marks. This is an example of um, a cryolite image of such a setup. Uh, we are looking at um, this area here, S and N. When you zoom in, you can see these marks um, and uh, cells near the region of interest um, merged with DAPI fluorescence. And we can, again, uh, relocate these under the top sense optical microscope, and then we can uh, get mass spectrometry readings from these cells. Um, this is an example result um, um, slide from one of our mass spec um, demonstrations for correlative imaging in cryostate. Uh, I'll try to my best to get out the most information, uh, most important information out of it. So, on the example on the left, uh, we have run the uh, analysis on two modes: the time of flight mode and the uh, Orbi Sims mode. So. Um, uh, here you can see cells uh, labeled with Hirschstein blue, and um, we can see that we can relocate the same cells and uh, in the time of flight analyzer, and then we can merge them to have a correlative image uh, to reveal the chemistry. In this case, this is the phosphocholine marker uh, at 184 marsh. We can do this in the Orbi platform as well, where we can uh, look at um, cells of interest, relocate them in the Orbi platform, and we can get a correlative image of uh, subcellular chemistry. The important thing is if we compare the TOF and Orbi, uh, Orbi has a much better uh, resolution of the mass peak. You can see that the uh, the width of the peak is much uh, sharper here, and also you get a better intensity of detection. However, it has to be noted that TOF was one of the business beam and uh, Orbi was one of the argon source, so it's not the best um, uh, example to compare, but also but it reflects what I'm trying to uh, the point I'm trying to make here. Particularly, the Orbi is very useful to look, looking at larger molecular species, which um, which um, conventionally won't be easy to look in the TOF sims. For example, here we're looking at phosphatidyl inositol, which has a mass of 885, and we're not looking at anything in the bismuth beam TOF sims analysis. We can look at peaks uh, that come up in the Orbi sims. So this is really nice. This is a demonstration of how we can use the Orbi platform to do subcellular correlative uh, chemical analysis. Um, what about the larger molecules such as RNA species and how can we differentiate between them? So uh, to this end, we developed uh, another approach called the 3D cryo -fipsim. Uh This is for subcellular transcriptomics. And um, just to give a brief, again, a general description of what the FIPSIM 
machine is. Uh, so it's um, the FIPSIM stands for Focused um, Ion Beam Scanning Electron Microscope. It is conventionally used um, in cryoclim to lift out specific um, uh, regions out of our cell or tissue and to thin them to look at ultrastructural correlation um, uh, under the transmission electron microscope. And we think we can use this too for transcriptomics as well. In this slide, I'll try to summarize how we do it um, step by step. So um, this uh, image here shows a bright field and uh, fluorescent merge image of MCF7 breast cancer cells um, labeled with fluorescent DAPI. And this is a subcellar region of interest uh, that we are trying to get the transcriptome for. Uh, we relocate the same cell region on uh, cryo um, scanning electron microscope. We use an ion beam to mill out a region around it expose the surface and we use a micro needle to attach it to the biopsy lift it free and deposit it on an ACLAR material which is a um, PCR compatible uh, plastic and we use water vapor to glue that um, biopsy onto the plastic uh, we transfer it to a PCR tube through which we can then do um, the qPCR or RNA sequencing this is a pilot data which shows that um, uh, which shows the samples on the y-axis and this PCR CT values, cycle values on the x-axis. And we can see compared to the negative controls with CT values are much higher than 36, the um, positive biopsies uh, detect much more RNA in the, in, in, in the sample. That shows that we can uh, actually be uh, site-specific and do um, cryobiopsies that allows for high quality, unprocessed native biotranscriptome at the subcellular scale. Um, to summarize, we've demonstrated uh, two new um, possible extensions to um, a conventional CLEM with compositional correlation. And right now we want to um, uh, demonstrate uh, look at what kind of applications they can extend towards in biology, um, one of which is extracellular vesicle characterization. We know that uh, extracellular vesicles or EVs are really small and um, their single EV analysis is quite difficult. And they have a lot of applications in drug delivery and biomarker discovery. And it'll be really helpful if we can do single EV analysis. And here we are just demonstrating that we, if a cryo correlative, uh, conventional cryo correlative microscopy, we'll be able to look at CEVs and the ultrastructure at single EV level and correlate them to their fluorescent mark markers. And the next step we are doing, uh, trying to move this to cryogenic um, um, analysis and also extending it to transcriptomic and lipidomic analysis that I've mentioned before. We're also looking at um, subcellular characterization. This is an example of a cryoconfocal image uh, of um, MDA breast cancer cells labeled with endoplasmic reticulum dye and nuclear dye in blue, endoplasmic reticulum being in green. What you're looking at here is a subcellular fragment of a nuclear membrane invagination. And what we are uh, hoping to do is to do uh, orbisims on this to look at um, um, the lipidomics uh, information that, um, that uh, gives us more detail about uh, the functionality of such invaginations in cancer. We're also moving into tissues. This is a high pressure frozen kidney tissue fragment and um, um, labeled with uh, DAPI in blue, which is for nucleus. We can look at tubules and glomerulus. Um, what we're interested to do is to get a um, um, cryocorrative approach to study the chemical and ultrastructural details of, um, of blood vessels and demonstrate um, why at ultra what changes at ultrastructural level mediate um, blood vessel leakage in disease models. I'd like to thank um, uh, my collaborators and uh, thank you for the opportunity and um, I'm ready to answer questions. Thank you very much for that. That was a really good summary of your work. Thank you. Uh, thank you for doing that. Um, we're a little short of time, um, uh, so perhaps just one quick question. Leandro has asked, um, is your work on cryo or BCMs, um published? Um, can you find it anywhere? Uh, yes, uh, the Orbisims platform is published in Nature. I could possibly send a link uh, by somehow. Um, it's by Passarelli, it was from 2017, but uh, the cryocorrelative aspect of it was not demonstrated in that paper, so uh, these results are pilot. Okay, okay, perfect. Well, perhaps if you can find that link, you can add it to the uh, chat window and then uh, people can access it if they want to.
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much there. Have a good day. Um, so now we have online um, Ian Dobby. Hi, Ian. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Good, good, good. So a very brief um, introduction. Um, so Ian joined the University of Oxford after a postdoc at King's College London in 2008, I think. Um, he's now the manager of the Micron Imaging Facility at the University of Oxford. Um, he works with commercial imaging systems, but also constructs custom built instruments for specific experimental goals. Um, he's also the light microscopy section deputy chair of the RMS. Um, today he's going to talk to us about CryoSim, a cryo 3D structured illumination microscope for correlative ultrastructure. So over to you, Ian, um, when you're ready. Hi. Well, first, just one slight update there. I'm not actually a manager of the facility. We've hired somebody else to do that, Nadia Halidi, who's doing a brilliant job and has been there. Ah, so, apologies, apologies, Nadia, if you're online. <laughs> I'm actually working on doing uh, instrument development, and this is one of the instruments we've been working on for a few years. Perfect. Thank you for okay. clarifying. So there's been lots of information in the last couple of talks about correlative light and electron microscopy, and we're working on related technique, but rather than doing electron microscopy, we are trying to do correlative light microscopy with this beast down here, which is an X-ray microscope. So this is situated at the um, Diamond Synchrotron, which is about 20 miles south of Oxford. And they're using uh, soft X-ray tomography to generate uh, ultrastructural images with similar kinds of contrast that you get in cryo-EM uh, situations. The huge advantage of the X-ray over the EM is that the soft x-rays are able to penetrate through relatively large amounts of ice. So, you know, tens of microns of ice. So you can do a tilt section on a whole um, tissue sample or, or whole uh, tissue culture cells relatively easily. Okay, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to do correlative imaging and there's a huge drawback in the fact that your fluorescence microscopy has significantly lower resolution than your ultrastructural imaging. So possibly a factor of 10 lower in each dimension, and then that's a, that's a factor of 1,000 less. So in order to try and push the resolution, we're trying to do super-resolution optical microscopy, but still in cryo. So there are broadly three types of super-resolution optical microscopy, super-molecule localization microscopy, so like PALM or um, STORM-type imaging. There's STED microscopy, and then structural illumination microscopy. And I'm just going to briefly go through these three techniques. Okay, so single molecule localization microscopy involves um, turning off most of your uh, fluorophores at once and imaging a tiny subset of them so that they're well enough separated that you can localize them each to very, very high precision, much higher than the optical resolution of your microscope. The fundamental problem with this is that nearly all the techniques for turning off your fluorescence involve very high laser powers. And like all the uh, cryo EM type approaches, we're really keen. We must keep our samples below the glass transition temperature, which is about 100 minus 140 degrees Celsius. So um, having high laser power in there is very detrimental to the sample and tends to heat the sample up dramatically. And that can lead to uh, ice formation and sample damage. The other issue with single molecule localization imaging is that if you've got thick samples with lots of background, it can be very difficult to, to separate your individual uh, molecule, molecular blinks from the background signal. Okay, so STED, if you thought that the single molecule localization had high laser powers, the STED laser powers are hugely bigger. If you look at the original STED papers from Stefan Hell's labs, the, um, the emission beam, the stimulated emission beam, which they use, has got powers of the gigawatts per centimeter squared. And being able to do this in cryo uh, is frankly just not, we haven't even thought about trying it, really difficult. Okay, so structural illumination. So this is the technique that we're actually using. The main limitation of it, from our point of view, is you only get two times the resolution gain. However, that two times is in all three dimensions. Okay, another limitation for SIM in kind of conventional imaging modes is that bleaching is a major problem because you have to take a lot of images. And if we're doing uh, 10 micron stacks or something, you might be at 2,000, 4,000 images, something like that. However, the samples in cryo have much lower bleaching rates. So it's able to take many, many more images without leading to uh, damage. And then the other issue is that if you've got to take these large number of images, the sample is worried about the rate at the speed at which you're imaging, whereas your samples in cryo are completely stationary, so you don't have to worry about imaging rate. 
okay and that there is limited depth penetration in sim but that's kind of similar to the depth penetration which we get for our uh, x-ray um, the soft x-rays penetration through our tom for our tomogram so that's not a fundamental problem here okay excuse me a sec. <coughs> sorry um, so what do you do with structural illumination well rather than visualizing your sample with an even illumination field you use illumination which has got structure to it and this is just an example of the kind of information you extract so these are the images are two great two gates both of which have a hexagonal grid pattern and you can see that because the hexagonal grids are slightly different sizes because they're slightly different distances from the camera you get to see one grid through the other and this kind of uh, regular pattern being imposed on on top of another imaging thing is called moir patterns uh, or moir way and this information actually encodes information which is higher than the frequency of observable information in your image so what we do is we take our stripes and the stripes are very very fine and then we move the stripes across the image and actually rotate the stripes. And I'll explain why we do that in a minute. And then we shovel this data into a computer processing algorithm, which reconstructs the information at twice the normal resolution. Okay, so this is real data. And I don't know if you can see this image is a bit small, but so this is HeLa cells with mitotraphic green in it. And uh, there are stripes at this orientation in this image and at this orientation in this image and at this orientation in this image. So these are three individual frames from a stack of a couple of thousand images. And this is actually a two color data set. But I just don't have the other data here. So you can't really just to make it simpler to see. And by having the stripes and then moving them across your sample. So at any given Z plane, we have five different positions of stripes that we move. And then we do three different orientations. And the five stripes in one orientation gives you increased resolution along that one axis. And then we get increased resolution in this axis, in this axis, and then in this axis. And so, oh, sorry, let's get to the next slide. Okay, so this is then taking one of these images. So what I've done is I've taken one of these images and done a Fourier transform of it. And when you perform a Fourier transform extracting the frequency information, you see this uh, characteristic pattern. We've reduced the central spot in the Fourier transform because that's much brighter than all the others, but we actually get two extra sets of spots. And this is typical of 3D structured illumination. In 2D structured illumination, you only get two extra spots, one at each side, right at the edge. Okay. And around each of these spots, we actually get the complete original information reproduced. So there's the original information in the middle and then around the outside spots. And what the computer algorithm does is it separates the components from the center and from the outer spots on each side. And then it shifts them and reimposes them. And if you look in Fourier space, the limit of our uh, information is somewhere around here, which is where right where the spots are. OK, and this gives a circle of information, which is the resolution limit that you achieve in optical microscopy. And if we take this information here, which is an exact copy of the complete uh, region, and we move this spot back to the center, the information that we've extracted here, which is all the way out here, gets shifted further away. So that's what we're trying to show here. You've got the circles. And you take the information from here and shift it to the center, and that gives you information on this side. You take the information from uh, from this position, position this particular the spot up here, and you shift it to the center, and that gives you information on the other side. And then if we do the three different angles, you end up with this kind of floral pattern. And the distance of this floral pattern from the center of the Fourier space is twice as high, so you get twice as much resolution information. So you've doubled the frequency, doubled the resolution achievable. Okay, and this is just showing with some real data. Um, so this is the original image and the extracted components and then added back together again. And you can see the additional information. Okay, so we've constructed this based around uh, Lincoln cryo stage. So Michael was talking from Lincoln earlier on. This is a commercial cryo stage. And then we've got multiple illumination lasers, actually four, there's only three in this diagram. And then some optics for doing the stripe uh, creation and rotation and stuff and then two different cameras and we're using two EMCCD cameras to make the collection faster so that we can interleave the imaging as quickly as possible. Um, okay, uh, and then this is some example data. So this is actually some, uh, uh, the U2OS cells which have been infected with the Rio virus. And then we've got a galactose 3 marker which is able to uh, demonstrate where the 
cellular membrane, uh, which has been external cellular membrane and then revealed inside the cells. And we've got some data in a minute, which is showing about viral infections in these cells. So this is just a two color image from some cells. And then next to it, there's a line plot, which shows the, um, this is actually through a, through a uh, sub, sub resolution bead, 170 nanometer fluorescent bead. And just showing that the yellow is the wide field uh, fluorescence point spread function and the orange is the sim. So we actually double the resolution. So the wide field image is about 400 nanometers resolution. And in sim, we get about 200 nanometers. Okay. Ooh, sorry. We've also written our own software, which we'll talk about another time. But I'm not going to cover that too quick, too much detail because we haven't got much time here. Okay. So what we've done is we've collected this data. So this is actually from the same, similar data set. So this is the data with the red uh, signal, which is a cherry uh, galactane signal. And that, so the marker is on the outside of the cell. And then when the, um, when if vesicles are internalized and then ruptured, then the uh, M cherry binds to it and you see that the vesicle is ruptured as not. And then the green is actually from fluorescently libeled virus. And you can see the virus in these uh, multivesicular bodies inside the infected cells. And then this is just demonstrating the correlation between the two systems. Uh, it's a blow up of the same, exactly the same cell in the same regions. And I won't go into the biology because we haven't got much time uh, uh, for this talk. But then the other thing is that it's important to make sure that the data that you're analyzing, that you're producing is actually reliable and reproducible. And we spent a long time, many years working on doing uh, quality control checks on SIM data. And so we've got this SIM check, which is a PG plugin, which we do use to process an awful lot of the data just to confirm that the data actually gives you reliable information in the super resolution regions that we're interested in. Right. Uh, what's the biggest issues? The biggest ongoing issues are alignment of cryo uh, correlative imaging because getting good fiduciary markers which you can automatically find and then do alignment for for both the cryofluorescence and then the cryo x-ray or the cryo em uh, is still a significant drawback and that means a lot of time and effort and manual labor goes into producing good correlative imaging uh, image stacks um, the sample holders, we've actually made quite a lot of progress on this, moving from having conventional grids to having uh, auto grids. So the, the uh, grids are actually clamped, which makes them much more robust and much more e easily transferred between storage and imaging. And then also a sample holder, which we're able to mount on both the uh, cryofluorescence setup on, in the, on the Lincoln stage and to be able to move it directly onto the X-ray. Uh, microscope so then we can image and it's much easier to correlate if you've got a rough idea of where your sample is as opposed to having random orientations and stuff and then finally the cryofluorescence imaging is definitely compromised by the fact that the optics that we're using so the objectives are not designed for imaging in cryo and we are currently in the middle of a project where we're trying to add adaptive optics to improve the imaging on this setup and just final thing Acknowledgements. So this has been a long-term collaboration between the people in Micron in Oxford and uh, the Beamline 24 at Diamond, where Maria is the principal Beamline scientist. Um, and I think special thanks should go to Mick Phillips, who was with uh, Diamond for three years and then with us for three years and has recently moved uh, to a new job in the States. And uh, another person, uh, the Elan Davis and his lab have contributed a lot to uh, sample preparation and uh, user interface work with our software and things like that. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Ian. That was really, really good. Um, there was a couple of questions came through while you were giving your talk. The um, slide where you were explaining how you build up the floral pattern. You, yeah. were point, you were pointing, but they couldn't see your pointer. Okay. Could you go back to it and turn on the whiteboard and just maybe talk yeah. them through that again? That would be Let fantastic. me get back to it. Might take you a little while, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Anything else while we're getting there? Um, yeah, so uh, one quick question. Is it possible to thaw a sample after cryo-EM and image this sample using conventional SIM or any other type of microscopy? I think that's unlikely to work because the the x-ray probably kills the fluorescence i'd say 
the X-ray uh, imaging puts a lot of uh, uh, you know energy into the sample, and I think similar things would happen with EM. We've tried to do some stuff with uh, correlative light electron microscopy, and we tried to image before and then do the EM, and then go back to fluorescence, and we haven't really seen much. The signal right. becomes diffuse rubbish. But sure. if somebody's got a good mechanism for doing that, that would be great because if we could then take it and put it on a system with roughly twice the numerical aperture, we could get twice the resolution out of it. Definitely, definitely. Okay, okay. can you see my pointer or do I need to draw? Uh, yeah, uh, so we can see the whiteboard. So yeah, if you pick up a pen and just draw, and just explain roughly what, what okay. method is. So, so what we've taken is we've taken an image and we've done a Fourier transform of it. And the Fourier transform in the center here, where we've removed things, Thing. Hello, maybe. Hang on, sorry. That's okay. Let me get another color which you can see rather than there we go. No, it's still black. Maybe red. Red, yes. Okay. So that's where the center of the Fourier transform is. Yeah. And then the stripes which you see in the actual image are represented in Fourier space by these two sets of uh, spots on either side. So there's a, a core set of stripes which is represented by this spot here and a finer set of stripes, which is represented by the further out spot. The further you get from the middle of the Fourier transform, the higher the frequency. OK, and so the ones which really provide the most super resolution information are the two really high frequency spots, one on this side and one on this side. And around both of these spots, which are due to the stripes, you get an exact copy of all the original data which was in there. OK, so if we then go for a different color, so you take green, so this point here has an exact copy of all the original data, which is in Fourier space from, from the sample. So, and that goes from here to here, which is what you'd normally see in the, so from, from the spot to the center, but then you also get distance going twice as far. So this information is, is a circle, not a very good circle, sorry. Should have probably got a circle tool, okay? <laughs> Around here like this. And so, when you take this information and you transform it to be in the correct place in Fourier space into the middle, that then gives you this extra piece of graph. And so this spot here, which I'm circling, making really big, gives you this information around here because you've transferred the information to the middle in Fourier space, where it's meant to be. And the other spot, I'll go back for red. So this spot over here then gives you information around here. OK, so you're, you're taking the information. So you need multiple images in order to extract the different information components. And there are five different components, the one in the middle and then the two on the outsides. And so we need to take five images for one orientation of stripes. And that allows us to decompose it into five different uh, components in Fourier space. And then we transform them in Fourier space to be in the right place. So from the edge into the middle for the green and from the top edge into the middle for the red. And then you add them back together again and do a reverse Fourier transform, which gives you the image. And the image actually comes out with twice the resolution of the original image. Is that clear? Perfect. That's great. That's great. Um, and just a couple of uh, questions. We've got a couple of minutes left. Um, there are two questions, one from Jenek and one from Reina. Um, what objective lens magnification numerical aperture are you using? Is it um, a dry lens? It's uh, We're using a, a, air, a long working distance air objective. So it's a 0.9 um, 100x Nikon objective with two millimeters working distance. And I see that uh, Ryan is asking, is it cold? It's not super cold. So the the objectives actually in, well, you're looking through a, a, some kind of a gradient of nitrogen, which starts off at liquid nitrogen temperatures at the sample at minus 196. And then at the front of the objectives is probably at 10 degrees or something like that. When you remove it from the sample, you don't get serious condensation on it or anything like that. So it's not that far from room temperature. And probably that gas gradient is the worst issue, although some cooling of the objective also distorts the image as well. So you get much better images if you do it at room temperature, but that's not what we actually want the images for. And what was the other question? Um, so we've got a few in there. If you want to look in the chat window, there's a, there's a couple you can pick out. Right. Uh, cryo caused crystallization. Well, hopefully we keep it below. Uh, 
minus 140 centigrade and you certainly don't see if you deliberately cause ice to be generated by heating the sample up it's very very clearly visible in both the optical imaging and in the x-ray imaging so no i don't think we get crystallization uh, which software to use for registration um, we use uh, the ec clam oh let's turn off the whiteboard yeah just how do i turn it off click Click there we go. Right. Uh, the registration image. It's it's slightly complicated because we've actually got two stage registration process because we have um, we have uh, transmission and fluorescence images with the optical microscope, and then on the X ray microscope we actually have a transmission optical microscope as well. So we align that coarsely. And that allows us to find a, a vague coordinate system. And then we go into uh, this, this image at the background here. The image that you see here is actually, you can see it's made up of small squares. This is a mosaic from X-ray transmission images. And then once we've localized our sample, so we know what cell we're looking at, we then box individual areas. So these are two individual areas. And then these two regions, so, so each of these is the field of view size of the x and for each of those we make a tomogram and then these are the reconstructed tomograms these these two images here are the reconstructed tomograms from this approach perfect okay in the interest of time i guess we should we should move on thank you very much again ian appreciate you joining right. us i hope you can stay on as an attendee um okay so next up we have um thomas sharp are you there? Hi. Oh, yes, hi, I Thomas. Am. Perfect. Um, so, you're, you were going to screen share, were you, Thomas? No, I sent my presentation to you. Okay. So hopefully you just it. Oh, yes, there it is. Great. Um, let's get rid of the whiteboard. Yes, please. Okay, so just a brief introduction. So, um, Thomas is a system professor at the LUMC and head of the Bio Nano Patterning Group. Um, before moving to the Netherlands, Tom was a postdoc at the University of Oxford. There's quite a few people from Oxford in this in this session, um, in the Division of Structural Biology and the Department of Physics. Uh, he also worked with Wolfson and Vicada at the University of Bristol. Um, today, he's going to talk to us about exploring immune system activation using super resolution cryo -clem. So over to you, Thomas. Thank you very much. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for Philippa and Lee for uh, the invitation to speak here today. Uh, I'm now going to turn my webcam off because my bandwidth is rather low, so I'll try and save it slightly uh, with that. But hopefully you can all still hear me. Uh, yes, so I run a group at the Leiden University Medical Centre in the Netherlands, where we primarily use three techniques. That's cryo-EM, synthetic biology and super resolution light microscopy uh, to investigate our immune system. And today I'll talk about how we're developing super resolution methods to image the human complement pathway. Now, complement is an essential part of our innate immune system, but it can also be activated by our adaptive immune system. And as such, complement plays a key role in immune defense uh, against invading pathogens, as well as clearance of cellular debris, which helps to prevent autoimmune diseases such as arthritis and multiple sclerosis. Now, complement comprises around 30 proteins present in our blood and tissues. Uh, many of these circulate in an inactive form. Complement can be activated when IgG or IgM antibodies bind to antigens, perhaps on a bacterial cell surface, as I've shown here, and they form a platform. And this platform acts like a landing pad for the first component of complement called the C1 complex. C1 comprises an antibody binding and scaffold complex called C1Q that I've shown here in blue, uh, and two serine proteases called C1R and S that I've shown here in pink. And these form a heterotetramer inside of C1Q. Binding of C1Q to these antibody platforms induces activation of C1 RNS. And this initiates a cascade of events uh, resulting in coverage or opsonization of the bacterial membrane and enhanced phagocytosis of the bacterium. And the cascade terminates with the formation of a pore called the membrane attack complex, which lyses the bacterium. So if it hasn't been eaten by macrophages, it will be popped by the mac pore. Uh, now, to mimic pathogenic bacteria, we make antigenic liposomes 
that can bind antibodies and activate the complement system. And we have a number of biophysical assays to measure this. Now I've collected 3D uh, phase plate cryoelectron tomograms at each point of this linear cascade uh, that you can see here. I could then fit in recognizable components of complement into these 3D maps, such as the blue C1Q uh, and C1 uh, complex in total, and the pink MACPOR that you can see here. Uh, and thereby create molecular atlases of this cascade's progression. And now we have these atlases, we can zoom into specific steps and look at these in more detail. Now, over the last few years, we've published the structure of uh, C1Q bound to IgG antibodies that you can see here in red. And last year, we followed this with the first structure of the IgM antibody shown here in green and combined this with the complete structure of the C1 complex, uh, including the serine proteases for the first time. So you can see C1R in, in purple and C1S in pink. Now, the great thing was we even managed to catch this enzyme in the act, uh, still bound to its product, C4B, that you can see here in cyan. And this was because we used full human serum, and that's basically blood with the red blood cells removed. Uh, we didn't purify anything. And I think this really shows the power of cryo-electron tomography, combined with in silico purification by classification. Uh, and finally, a few years ago now, we solved the structure of the terminal MAC pore, again, in situ. All of this was done on the bacterial mimetic liposomes that I just talked about. However, our immune system doesn't normally act in a vacuum or on liposomes. So I'm also aiming my lab towards cellular systems. Now to do this, uh, we'll need to locate individual molecules or complexes on a crowded membrane. Uh, to see rare or transient events on cells requires high accuracy to zoom in in cryo-EM. Now we have access to a Fibsim, uh, Fibsem that you've already heard about at uh, Nissen, which is the Dutch Centre for Electron Microscopy. So we'd like to locate our proteins both before and after fib milling lamellae using fluorescence microscopy. Uh, and all of this requires accurate alignment of images and super resolution light microscopy and or correlative light and electron microscopy. And the rest of my presentation will be on how we're attempting to address some of these challenges. So a single one of our cells is around 20 microns wide whilst disease causing viruses such as COVID-19 are um, 200 times smaller than that. And most proteins are another 10 to 20 times smaller than that. So in fact, a single antibody protein is one and a half thousand times smaller than our cells. And that's length in terms of area. A single antibody covers less than 0.0006% of a human cell surface and accounts for just 0. 0.000000001% of its volume. So these proteins are tiny. However, with cryoEM, we can see their constituent atoms, but now we have a different problem. So even though we can see them, how do we actually find these tiny proteins? Well, we add a fluorescent marker, which then guides us where to look. And this is one of the aims of correlative light and electron microscopy, or CLEM, as you've heard about, uh, that we do in my lab. And we've developed several methods to do so-called cryoclem in my lab. So my student, Marta Teutel, um, has worked on developing methodology for super resolution cryoclem using fluorescent proteins. Now, I don't need to tell you about the benefits of super resolution. Um, you've heard about some of them already and you'll hear a lot more about them in this afternoon session, but we're interested in super resolution cryoclem. So in a sea of identical structures, such as these fibers, we want to find out which actually contains our protein of interest. Now, traditional fluorescence, uh, cryofluorescence microscopy can guide us within around half a micron uh, of where our protein of interest actually is. And that means if one of these fibers were labeled, we couldn't actually tell which one. For that, we require super resolution light microscopy, which can guide us to within 50 nanometers or so of the protein. Now, we use uh, single molecule localization microscopy, which Ian uh, briefly explained earlier. This includes techniques like uh, palm or storm and consists of turning on a small subset of fluorescent probes that are, that are spatially separated so that we can find their centers with very high accuracy. These are then turned off and another subset are turned on. We find their centers. We do this again and again and again, um, hundreds or maybe thousands of times and summing them up yields a super resolution reconstruction. Now to do super resolution light microscopy in cryo is, uh, it is difficult. Firstly, we have to use cryo stages to keep our samples at around minus 180 degrees Celsius to maintain sample vitrification. 
And for these, we use the link and cryo stage that you heard about uh, from Michael at the start. And as you've also heard uh, that vitrification is not the same as freezing. With freezing, you get crystallization. Vitrification, you end up with a glassy-like state, which means um, that you have to keep it below minus 135 degrees Celsius at least at all times. Um, whereas Martin is, uh, he's works at room temperature. So we have a huge temperature differential between them. And that means we get suffer from quite a lot of thermal drift, which has to be mitigated to recover the high resolution information. Now, Martin did this by adding beads and tracking them. Um, but he could also use the sample in, itself and he can correct this drift up to 20 nanometers in X that you see at the top and in Y that you see at the bottom. Now we haven't tackled Z yet, but we do have some plans to do so. Photons also devitrify ice, which completely ruins cryo-EM imaging. Now, previously, people have had to add cryoprotectants to stop this, which isn't even possible nor, uh, nor desirable. Or used extremely long pulsed illumination schemes where they illuminate the sample, then wait for the heat to dissipate before illuminating again. Instead, we found that devitrification is dominated by the laser intensity and not the total dose or the duration of imaging. In fact, in more than 95% of samples, we could avoid devitrification entirely for more than 30 minutes by using a laser power of 550 watts per square centimeter. However, if we increase this to 650 watts per square centimeter, devitrification occurred very rapidly within five minutes, as you can see from these cubic ice speckles. This is devitrification. And this was a consistent phenomenon, with devitrification starting rapidly in the center uh, of the grid squares. However, this is dependent on the kind of grid you use, and we're now getting a handle on this um, to hopefully allow us to use higher laser powers for longer periods of time. Now, the behavior of fluorescent proteins um, in vitreous conditions is also largely unknown. And when we did it, we saw a slight blue shift um, between the ambient temperature in red and minus 180 degrees C or so in blue. Uh, so we saw a slight blue shift in the peak, um, but not enough to require different filter sets or lasers. However, when we added cryoprotectants, there was a larger shift. So 50% glycerol that you can see in the bottom right here induced a shift around 10 nanometers. And in some cases, this may require uh, different filter blocks to maximize the signal. So for fluorescent light microscopy, we need fluorescent beacons. And traditionally, we use fluorescent proteins such as GFP. However, GFP is not traditionally photo switchable. Single molecule localization microscopy requires uh, photo switchable fluorescent proteins, proteins that can be turned on and off with different wavelengths of light, uh, such as this one here that is turned on with 405 nanometer light and deactivated with 488 nanometer light. Now, this is needed so that subsets can be activated and deactivated during uh, data collection. For the, fast, for the, for the, uh, for the last 15 years or so, photo switchable proteins have been developed to work efficiently and quickly at ambient temperatures, such as RSE GFP2 shown here. And here you can see uh, an increase in fluorescence after an activating pulse with a wavelength of 405 uh, nanometer light. And those, those are the peaks on the right hand side. Illumination with 488 nanometer light then rapidly turns off the protein before the process is repeated. And if you can compare this on the left hand side, uh, with GFP, you can see there's basically no photo switching. And this is all at ambient temperatures, 21 degrees. However, we discovered something uh, I think quite fascinating. Fluorescent proteins behave differently when vitrified. In fact, even non-switchable proteins like GFP become switchable when vitrified. So now at the bottom, you can see at minus 180 degrees Celsius, both GFP and RSE GFP2 display uh, switching, photo switching uh, characteristics. And this is a consistent phenomenon. So these seven proteins here all have different switching mechanisms. On the left, you can see at ambient temperatures, they have different switching profiles. However, all of them behave pretty much identically at cryo temperatures that you can see on the right here. And this means that, in theory, all seven of these can be used for super resolution cryoclem. And this is rather remarkable because it means there's a common mechanism for switching that is accessible in the vitreous conditions used for cryo-EM, but not accessible at room temperature. Now, one important thing to notice here are the absolute Y values. It takes a very long time to deactivate all of the fluorophores. And this is why Martin developed an image differencing method for data analysis. So I'll 
uh, quickly explain how we collect these data. Uh, first, a small subset of fluorescent proteins are activated using a 200 millisecond pulse from the purple 405 nanometer activation laser before the sample is illuminated with the 488 excitation and deactivation laser shown in cyan. Fluorescence is recorded using 40 frames of 50 milliseconds acquisition time with a 20 millisecond dwell time between each frame to write the data to disk. And you can see the zoom in of this acquisition scheme on the upper right. These short acquisition times, um, I just see I've got a question. I'll answer these at the end, I think. These short acquisition times allow us to correct for drift by aligning all of the frames using a, a rigid transformation. So next, the final frame of each cycle, that's the middle row, uh, is subtracted from all of the frames of the next cycle. This is the differencing method. And this lets us see only those fluorophores that are newly activated, uh, which we can then localize with our point spread function in Thunderstorm. Now, we obviously wanted to take this into cells, so we transfected uh, eukaryotic mammalian cells to label microtubules with RSEGFP2. Now, here you can see the bright field image of some cells on a cryo-EM grid, uh, and here's the wide field fluorescence image. And just for comparison, here is the super resolution uh, re uh, reconstruction. Now, next, you're going to see the cryo-EM image. Um, and as you can see, there's not a lot of features that you can match between those two images. And this shows the importance and indeed the difficulty of aligning images from these different modalities. However, here's Martin working at our old F20 uh, microscope, which has a fluorescent microscope in the side port. So that's at the upper left. Now to move from fluorescence to electron microscopy, we simply rotate the sample holder. That's that tiny little dewer sticking out of the microscope uh, by 90 degrees. And then both of those images from the wide field uh, fluorescence and cryo-EM are automatically correlated because we understand this rotation. And on the uh, right in the red, you can see the super resolution reconstruction that we actually created. Uh, we reconstruct that on, uh, offline. This can be aligned very easily with the low resolution uh, fluorescence image in the middle, which is automatically aligned with the cryo-EM image. And so when we zoom in, you can see the wide field fluorescence image here and the huge improvement of the super resolution. You can actually see that there's two or more separate strands coming through here. Now, usually right now I have a very nice movie in which we move through a cellular cryo-electron tomogram, but unfortunately they didn't work very well over the internet. So instead I've put in a side-by-side -side comparison uh, of the super resolution image and a slice through a 3D cryo-electron tomogram showing the signal aligning to the intracellular microtubules. And so uh, what's next? Well, we're applying this methodology to cells of the immune system. Uh, we can already use thin cells such as bacteria or the cellular lamellipodia, um, but we will be using fib milling um, to get cellular lamellae as well. I've already mentioned the importance of sample support to limit ice devitrification. So we're trying to find and develop ideal cryo-EM grids for super resolution. Uh, for years now, fluorescent proteins have been mutated to generate ideal probes for room temperature super res. And so we're now doing the same for cryo super res. Um, we're also already doing multicolor CLEM, but we want to do multicolor super resolution too. So we're developing methodology for that. And finally, we want to work on improving the Z resolution so that we can actually guide fib milling of large cells. And that just leaves me to thank a lot of people. A lot of this work was done by Martin. Um, other members of my lab and my collaborators at the LUMC. Stefan Jacobs is our resident expert on super resolution at MPI in Göttingen. Um, I didn't talk much about the chemistry or the electron microscopy, however, they're done at the Leiden University by Amy Boyle, um, and all the EM data is also collected at Leiden University at Nissen, which is the Dutch Centre for Electron Microscopy. Peter's a long term collaborator of mine for all of my complement work. And finally, I'd really like to thank the ERC for awarding me a starting grant so I can actually do this work. And of course, thank you all for your attention. I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have. I'll turn thank my camera back on as well. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Tom. That was really, really good. Um, so did you want to um, go into the chat window and see any questions you want to answer or do you want me to read them out for you? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll go through. There's, a, um, there's three there. Great. Uh, so where do I start? Oh, Ian Dom. Um, yes, so for de-vitrification above 550 watts per square centimetre, what grids and what wavelength? 
so the grids we used were um, two one uh, C flat grids. And as long as we stayed below um, 550 watts per square centimeter, I showed 30 minutes there, but we've gone on for much, much longer. Um, we see more contamination, but that was due to um, external ice settling on the grid. Um, but we don't, we never see any de-vitrification. With different grids, such as Quantifoil, they have a, they have a thicker carbon film. And we actually saw de-vitrification much, much quicker, even at these lower, uh, at lower laser powers. So a very thin C um, carbon film is one of the major um, contributors to help us collect these data. The thicker that gets, the more you have to reduce the laser power. Um, so I hope that's answered your question. Uh, Wojtek, mm -hmm. Wojtek, could you elaborate on the grid types you've explored in order to allow high laser powers to be used? Uh, not really yet, because we haven't done this systematically yet. Um, as I just mentioned, the thicker the carbon film, the worse things are. So to grow uh, cells, we actually use gold grids with a thicker carbon film. Um, and the cells themselves actually act like cryoprotectants. That's quite a well-known phenomenon. So we don't see any de-vitrification in or nearby the cells. Um, but as we move away, even at 550 watts per square centimetre, we do sometimes see de-vitrification. Um, and we think that's simply because of the thicker carbon film necessary to grow these, uh, these cells. Um, continuous carbon film is pretty good um, as long as it's thin. And uh, we, we tried plastic and that worked really well, except we got a lot of autofluorescence and blinking from the plastic film itself. So we're now, we're only just starting to go through these grid types uh, systematically. Okay. And can you see the last question from Jan? Yes, I can. So okay. great observation related to photo switching of GFP and cryo conditions. Thank you. Uh, could one also use a uh, band of excitation light from mercury or xenon lamp lighter or a laser strongly recommended for this effect to happen? That is a really excellent question. We're, because we're using relatively low laser powers, we're interested in using LEDs for a number of reasons, one of them being that they're much, much cheaper. Um, so my guess is that you could use a number of different, um, different illumination uh, techniques or sources um, as long as you have the ability to lower and control the excitation power you actually put on your on your sample and okay. I see one's also popped up from Robert yeah right one last answer. question yeah that'd be fine right. so some labs are using silicon oxide as support on grids uh, yes they appear to be extremely good but we haven't tried this yet um, but that is that is right at the top of our list because other groups have had really good um, experience with these. Okay, I think we probably need to leave it there in the interest of time. Um, just to let the attendees know that um, Tom and our next speaker, Reiner, I only asked them to speak at the weekend. Um, so they really have done a brilliant job in pulling together the presentation and learning how to use the, the platform, etc. So thank you very much, Thomas. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Have, have a good week. Bye. Uh, so we should have uh, Professor Kaufman online. Um, are you there, Rainer? I'm here. Uh, Perfect. So the client is okay. telling me that the internet is too slow, so that's the reason why there's no video. Okay, no problem. So just to introduce you, um, so this is Professor Rainer Kaufman. He's from the Experimental Cryophotonics Group at the University of Hamburg. Um, he's got a strong background in the development of super resolution methods, having worked with groups at the University of Oxford, like many of our previous speakers, including at Micron, Struby, and the Dunn School. Um, his group are combining fast freezing techniques with super resolution imaging. And today he's going to wrap up this session by talking to us about CryoSophy, a low dose super resolution scheme for CryoClem. So over to you then, Rainer. And again, thank you very much for doing this at such short notice. Yeah, thanks. And thanks a lot for the invitation <clears throat> and the nice introduction. So as the two previous speakers, I will talk about um, a method for super resolution uh, fluorescence microscopy under cryo conditions. And the purpose of um, developing this cryosophy method was um, motivated by what Ian and Tom were already mentioning, um, the problem of devitrification de um, when doing super resolution microscopy on vitrified samples. So this is again a very brief, brief overview of difference of the three big different super resolution methods. So we heard about SIM and we heard about 
um, single molecule localization microscopy, and Ian was also briefly mentioning STAT. Sophie, in terms of the data acquisition, is very similar to um, SMLM. Uh, microscopy, the data analysis is what's slightly different, and I'll come to this in a, in a minute. So, as we heard already, devitrification is a big issue for doing um, super resolution microscopy and vitrified samples because you typically use relatively high laser intensities for the photo switching that you need um, to basically extract the super resolution information um, from your sample if you're doing single molecule localization microscopy or stat microscopy. So, anywhere we somehow have to switch fluorescence on and often in, in some way. And already relatively low laser intensities, if you compare it to what people are using at ambient temperatures, already relatively low laser intensities can very rapidly devitrify um, the eyes. And we heard that it's more, it's basically a threshold of intensity and it's not so much um, an effect of the total dose. So already a couple of years back, um, so when you look at the very early publications of doing super resolution microscopy on vitrified samples, you'll find that there are some workarounds and Tom has already mentioned cryoprotectants, um, which basically raise the devitrification temperature. So you can apply a slightly higher laser intensity before you start growing ice crystals in your samples. And the other thing is the the coating of your crit, sort of the support film, and Tom has already mentioned that um, the, the typical support for, for cryo-EM samples is a uh, wholly carbon film, and the carbon absorbs a lot of light, so that's why it heats up the sample, and it's also not, it doesn't have a very good heat conductivity. So people tried other things for super-resolution cryoclam, like uh, foam var coated crits, but they are not so ideal for then the, doing the, the cryo-EM afterwards. So that's why already some years back we um, went into different direction in terms so basically lowering the laser intensities to a to a value where we can be sure that nothing's happening to the sample and investigating um, what we can still get out of the sample um, to do a super resolution microscopy and um, so. This was basically focused around the idea of doing single molecule localization microscopy, but um, everybody who has done that and just also at room temperature and lowered the simply lowered the uh, laser intensities uh, will find that this nice switching behavior um, decreases. So you get more overlapping signals, you get less signal to noise and so on. So it gets more difficult to really um, uh, get the localization, so the, the, the positions of the underlying molecules very precisely or at all. And that's, oops, that's how we um, came back to this rather old idea of SOFI, super resolution optical fluctuation imaging. And um, we're basically investigating whether this would be um, a useful um, concept for cryo super resolution imaging. And um, so for SOFI, you also do time series and you look at um, temporal fluctuations of um, the fluorescence intensity. So the data acquisition that you do is very similar to single molecule localization microscopy. Um, but what SOFI doesn't require is a, a proper separation of the, uh, of the point spread functions of the underlying um, molecules. It only requires as the name uh, suggests, to see some fluctuations in intensity. And what you then do, you basically go through the individual pixels um, along time and do a correlation. So if you correlate two pixels, um, you will only get, a, so if you do an autocorrelation, you will only um, see a correlation if um, signal is arising from a single molecule that's switching on and off. So if it's noise in the pixels, background noise basically, um, then there won't be any correlation. And if you look at the, the correlation coefficients, and if you basically would just plot them um, as an image, so if you look at, for example, what's there written on the bottom of the slide, the, the second uh, correlation coefficient, this 
u functions basically the PSF, and that's squared. And if you go to higher correlation orders, you you get basically to the you, know, the, you get the point spread function to the power of n. So you you basically if you plot the correlation uh, as an image, you get a point spread function that's um, smaller, thinner. So you uh, increase the resolution. So that's very, in very basic terms the concept of of uh, Sophie in general. Uh, so what are the advantages of Sophie for doing super resolution under drier conditions? So the, the, the biggest advantage is that it re, uh, relaxes the requirements that you need to have for the switching and and the blinking compared to proper single molecule localization microscopy. Because as I said, you don't require the separation of the point spread functions. You just need to see some um, intensity fluctuations, basically. Um, you can, you also don't uh, require as many uh, images um, as you can see some, uh, which is basically lowering the, the total dose. But as Tom already said, that's not having such, such a big effect. But um, in terms of the, the cryo stages, which are currently relatively um, mechanically instable, um, it helps a lot if, if you don't have to record for a very long time. And because you can use any fluctuations in fluorescence intensity, um, you can basically use any, um, any fluor form um, that's out there. And here's some um, examples um, of what you can achieve with cryosophy. So um, on the top left, uh, if you separate this image in the middle, there's always there's the, the just the conventional um, fluorescence, cryofluorescence image as you get from the commercial uh, microscope. And then there's a comparison between the conventional um, cryofluorescence and the cryosophy with the um, cryo-EM image in the background, which is sliced through um, a tomochrome. And here we had um, fluorescently labeled actin. And um, you can see that if you compare the, the cryosophy, basically the, the manually segmented actin in the cryo-EM image, um, what we see in the fluorescence fits, fits much better to uh, what we expect um, if, uh, compared to the Hello, Reina. Just um, uh, an aside, if you wanted to point to any of those images, just remember the whiteboard functionality. Um, it's the little pencil in the top corner. If you wanted to highlight any things, the little slider will make it more or less transparent. Okay, then, I have seen. Yeah. Thanks. No. All right. Um, uh -huh. So this is this is another example um, where we had um, the endoplasmatic reticulum labeled as a conventional fluorescence fluorescent protein, and um, this is more interesting in terms of what you usually would use um, uh, correlative microscopy for. So to have um, uh, basically different information from the or complementary information from the fluorescence and from the EM. So in the, on the top, you can see again the overlay of the conventional fluorescence with the EM, and on the bottom, the, the cryosophy. And um, so you can see there in the background in the EM image, these vesicular structures. Um, and if you look at the fluorescence information in the cryosophy image, so basically where there are um, the, the little blue stars, um, this is these are vesicles with very um, few fluorescent proteins um, uh, compared to other vesicles that have that are uh, highlighted by the fluorescence very brightly. So, and this is information that you only can see in the combination of the super resolution um, with the uh, cryo EM. So, from the conventional cryo FM images, you would not get this uh, information, and also you wouldn't get this information from um, uh, Cryo-EM, for example, alone. Here are some um, basic features of SOFI um, in general. So um, aside from the, the resolution increasement that you get from looking at the higher order um, correlation coefficients, um, you also get optical sectioning. Um, 
So basically in set, if you don't do anything else, you get um, equal um, optical section like a confocal uh, microscope basically. And another very nice feature is that it basically removes all the noise and all, all the background um, uh, due to, because you don't get any correlation of, of the noise um, by comparing uh, these different pixels. Um, so you can see these effects. So here on the top, there's again the conventional cryo-FM. So you can see in where you deep inside the cell, like the nucleus, the optical sectioning helps a lot. Um, there where it's shallow, you can see uh, mainly the resolution increasement. And there where the fluorescent signal is very weak, you can see that it helps reducing um, basically the, the background noise. This is just uh, a slide basically to prove that um, even after extensive imaging or with, with the, the cryosophy, um, the ice is still um, very nice, which you can also see in these Fourier transforms. And on the on the right, there's basically an example uh, which was actually on the same crypt, just I think two millimeters or something like that, away from um, where we were imaging, where the ice never has been really good, uh, just as a comparison how bad ice um, would look like. Um, in uh, TM. Um, another advantage of the, the, the SOFI in general, but also the cryosophy, is that it requires relatively few modifications to transform a basic wide field cryo um, fluorescent system into a, a super resolution system. So you can see on the list, it's only seven points, seven things that you need to add to uh, the conventional uh, cryofluorescence microscope. And the software is, um, you can just download it um, from GitHub. All right, so to conclude, um, I think super resolution uh, cryofluorescence microscopy is, uh, uh, is needed a lot to bridge the gap between um, uh, basically conventional light microscopy or cryo uh, light microscopy and EM and to uh, also link uh, functional information with structural information. Um, it's very important to keep in mind that uh, you have to stay at low uh, laser intensities and um, uh, to so that um, so which turned out to be one of the biggest challenges to do super resolution on the cryo conditions uh, particularly if you want to combine it afterwards with Cryo EM. So that's something you always have to keep in mind when doing a super resolution cryo clam. And um, then super resolution under cryo conditions for vitrified sample is still at a very early stage. Um, and there's lots of, uh, lots of issues that have to be um, looked at. So uh, Tom was mentioning uh, also the, the mechanical stability. Ian was talking about um, the effects of, of the optics when um, um, cooling them down, um, then the, the photo switching, we already heard about that before. It's um, very different at drier conditions. And um, there's also not a lot of um, um, studies um, out there looking at this. And um, of course, um, the deverification of the sample. Um, so already a few years back, we created this uh, so we basically, in a, in a review, we pulled together all the information that was accessible for doing super resolution under um, cryo conditions. So this is now already a few years old, but I think um, if you want to get into this, that's probably a good start to, to look at that, where you can also find a comparison, how the different super resolution methods, what um, is interesting and what's maybe challenging for the, for the different techniques. And that's it. So um, these are all the people I have to thank. A lot of the, the cryo Sophie stuff was still done uh, during my time in Oxford. And thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Rainer. That was perfect. Um, so we have a couple of questions coming in. Um, I don't know whether you want to read them out or whether you want me to read them to you. Um, I can go through them. So we haven't tried. Uh, the Aries scan um, yet for cryo microscopy. I don't know if anybody else has done that. No, I don't think so. I think uh, most most of them are Leica systems or or Lincam systems, aren't they at the moment? Um, but uh, I haven't heard too much about the Zeiss Aries scan yet. Um, 
Okay. So how many um, frames basically to create a sofa image? So we were acquiring typically 2000 frames. It's a lot on what kind of resolution you want to achieve. So this was basically, we were trying to get a factor of three in terms of resolution improvement. So with 2000 images, we could get up to the fourth order cross correlation. Um, if it depends what you want to achieve. So uh, if it's more important to have optical section and getting rid of the, the background, I guess a hundred or a few hundred images would already be uh, enough. Uh, multiple floor floors, no, we haven't used that yet, but that shouldn't be a problem. So we have tried lots of different floor floors, but not in, no way we had one sample. So yeah, we have a sample with YFP and um, some other fluorescent protein complement, but that works because um, the requirements for the switching or the blinking are not um, as uh, high as for proper single molecule localization microscopy. Uh, it looks like we have some answers to the Zeiss Airy scan question. Thank you, Michael, for that. So it looks like there is an application note. Perhaps you could share that application note with us, Michael, if there's a link to it, if people are interested. Um, I, I had a quick question, Reiner. Um, I've used the SURF algorithm before. Um, mm -hmm. You're using Sophie. Um, oh, and the, um, I was just wondering what the difference would be and if you've tried the SURF algorithm. We tried to surf algorithm. Um, I don't know if it changed, but this was when it was just, um, I think even before it was published or just mm -hmm. briefly afterwards. Um, we had some issues with um, artifacts from background features. So um, I'm not sure if that has changed. So, uh, so Sophie was, um, was there a lot more robust because the data that you get from um, from the, the, the cryo imaging is not as nice as what you can get at room temperature, where you can easily, um, where you just have a much, a much uh, clearer raw data. Sure. And then last last question then, uh, that one, uh, can Sophie be used for live cell imaging or is it just fixed samples? No, definitely. So that was what was Sophie basically, what Sophie was developed originally for. So this was at, so 2009 is the original paper from, and this was at a time when uh, it was quite difficult for biologists to get hands on a super resolution microscope. And uh, Sophie was developed as basically the poor man's super resolution microscope because it, you could basically do it without having lasers and a fancy camera. And uh, because it requires a lot less frames, it can, it's relatively fast and you'd go with a relatively low laser intensity. So um, that's why it's uh, well suited for live cell imaging. Brilliant. Well, thank you uh, very much for that. And again, thank you for stepping in at such short notice. We really appreciate it. Um, so our next session, session three, is going to be starting in about 15 minutes. Uh, so we better wind up this session now. Um, so people will need to exit this session and then click on the link for the next session to be able to access that one. So thank you so much for um, listening. Oh, um, Michael's just scared, shared the um, application note, so I'll give you a minute or so to click on that and um, look at it if you want to. Um, but apart from that, thank you very much indeed, and I hope to see you in the next session. Goodbye. <laughs>